Hello Internet, today we're going to talk about painting the blowfish. And we also have, for those gamers who are watching this, a little bit of progress and some development notes on the little game I'm making along with this as well and how that's going. Nah, no great news yet, but I can explain my thought processes and how I've gone about what I've done. First of all, we formed the boat out of 3mm MDF and we sort of braced it and then we covered the outside of the shell with fiberglass and then we braced it some more and then we covered the inside with fiberglass and then we put seats and structural elements in so now is the time to cover all of that and give it like a protective coating make it look pretty the fiberglass protects the MDF but it doesn't protect your eyes it's like not pretty to look at so first of all I'll talk about how I did the inside I was impatient and I was feeling a bit tight I had a bunch of uh, West System resin um, and some white pigment. <clears throat> so I thought I would do a wet on tacky multi coat over the inside of the hull. So I gave the inside of the hull a quick sand with like 120 grit paper, just so that there's something for the, um, the just so there's something for the resin to key to and bond to. Epoxy resin sticks to most things very, very well. There's a few plastics, polyethylene, um, that it just doesn't like. Um, nothing sticks to that stuff. Um, but generally, it'll stick to most things very well. But it's still worthwhile giving the fiberglass on the inside of the boat a sanding. When I laminated this, I tried to be fairly careful about rough edges and things sticking up. So we, we have to sand those off because there'll always be like bits of fiber sticking out somewhere. And if you just coat over them with something, you'll get them sticking in your bum or your hand or something like that unnecessarily. So first of all, give the whole thing a light sand with 120 and be fairly thorough about this. You don't want to surprise yourself with a sharp bit that you've missed. Then what I did was I mixed up about 200 grams of epoxy resin with about 3% pigment. I think it was 3%. Now the problem with using pigmented epoxy as a flow coat is it's very translucent. It doesn't, it's not very opaque. Uh, polyester resin on the other hand, you can actually buy a purpose-built flow coat. You can do your repair and then fill it and sand it and then put a flow coat over the top of it um, and it will cover pretty much in one go, almost. Depending on how fussy about finish you are. But with, po with epoxy, it doesn't do this. And if you don't want to sand between each coat, what you do is you wait for the epoxy resin to go tacky, like it should not leave anything on the end of your finger, but it should still be sticky. Um, and then you put the next coat on. So I ended up doing six coats in a, in a day, I think. I started early in the morning and finished off. And you could see it's not properly opaque. Uh, and maybe I just should have painted it, um, but I haven't. Um, and it is a way that you can put a coating over something that will take, you know, bumps and knocks. It is three rolled on layers of epoxy. Um, so it's going to be reasonably tough. Um, but yeah, like it would be nice if it was like more opaque. <clears throat> this leaves us with the outside of the boat now. So we flip the boat over and the first thing we do once again is sand it. Sand off all the high bits and then give the whole uh, boat a sand with 120. I actually did this by hand because it's very easy to sand through sharp corners if you're not paying attention. Um, when you're using a, a, a sanding machine, when you get to the edge of a boat, if you let it tilt, even with a, a, paper, a medium paper like 120, you'll sand through the fiberglass layer, even though there's two layers around all the edges, um, and then you'll have you know bare MDF, and we know that's no good. The next thing we did was we mixed up filler. Now I make my own filler as I've talked about earlier in the series. It's just um, epoxy resin um, with um, one quarter to one third thixotrope or WACA HD is what I use or Cabasil is another one. Um, I think <laughs> I just wrote thixotrope on, my, on the bin that I put it all in. And this is like an anti-sagging agent so it will leave your filler creamy and smooth and easy to spread, but it is not a filling agent. Um, so we need a filling agent, which is something that will bulk up the resin, because if we just covered the whole boat with half a millimeter of resin, it would like take a lot of resin and it would 
add a lot of weight. So for that, I use something called Q-cells, which is like little spheres of nothing. Think of like minuscule ping pong balls. So your 200 grams of, um, your 200 grams of resin will make quite a lot of filler. And I did not count how many mixes I did uh, for the whole boat. Um, so I can't tell you, but it was probably about a kilo and a half all up. So maybe five mixes or six mixes of about maybe 250 grams. The thing about using resins um, is that you don't want them to start going hard before you're ready. And when you add gluing compounds or filling compounds to a resin, they harden faster. So if you're on a day where there's like even the slightest amount of like ambient temperature, mix smaller batches because the last thing you want is like to be annoyed by your resin going off. The other thing probably worth mentioning is mix it in a clean container. Um, you can clean out all the old stuff from a container, uh, but there'll always be something in there. And then when you're, when you're um, applying it with the knife, you find that suddenly you leave a stripe because there's a little something stuck on the bottom of the knife that's leaving a stripe in the filler. The way I put the filler on is I just dob it on the surface and then spread it out with a knife that's, um, I think the knife's about a 150 millimeter one, but you know, you can see it's quite a broad knife. It also has a nice bit of flex in it. And you <clears throat> spread it out without pushing it too thin. I, I think you should try and leave about a quarter of a millimeter, I guess. It's sort of hard to judge, but like you shouldn't be able to see through it. And you'll see in some places here when I'm using the knife, I, I'm a little bit aggressive with it and you can start to see through the filler. Anyway, you fill the whole boat, then you do the edges because the, the edges you cannot do, like you can't take the knife across the bottom of the boat and then down the side and have like an even coat, like you'd have to have an enormously good hand to do that. So I tend to like do the top, do the side, then do the edge um, and give it a light sand in between. <clears throat> and once that's done, then I get the machine out and sand it with 120 and like fair that off. And then you have to do that all about three times. It is the worst job in building a boat that has a fiberglass laminate on the outside of the skin. Um, and the materials you use aren't particularly expensive, but you do use a lot of them. If you were buying like little box, little tins of, um, if you were buying little tins of panel beaters bog, you would go through a lot. So you're much better off buying like resin and what have you. And the other thing is panel beaters bog, I don't think will go off when it's on top of reasonably fresh epoxy. Uh, polyester chemicals do not tend to like if having epoxy underneath them. So lots of filling, lots of sanding, more filling, more sanding. And even then I didn't do enough because the final step of the process is to spray a primer on, um, a high build primer. I used an automotive high build primer, which I didn't spray very well. I'm not very good at spray painting. I can spray paint normal Turks filled enamels that you get from your local hardware shop. I can like make some furniture and spray some varnish on or, or a color or something. It looks great, but spraying two pack automotive paints, still something I've got to work out how to do. I had awful pinhole problems um, which I believe is putting too much paint on and, and um, volatiles under the surface of the paint bursting through. So after I put the primer on the first coat, I noticed there was a few bits where I hadn't sanded and filled enough. So I used some blade compound, which is like a special uh, super thin, super creamy putty that you could use for tiny little imperfections. Um, went around the boat, dusted it all off really well, looked at it, put that on, gave them all the sand, then put another primer coat on, then did all that again. And then I ran out of paint, so that was as far as I could go. I only had enough to do three coats, which was about a liter. It's actually about a liter and a half because you put a hardener in, which it like fills out the paint. Anyway, we picked green, obviously. The blowfish um, is the boat for the owl and the pussycat, basically. Um, <clears throat> and then after, once again, sanding with 120 and then down to 240 and then down to 400, all of which I did by hand because by this time, the amount of sanding you have to do, it's not very much. Just give it like a little rub, that's pretty good. And then you go to the next paper, that's pretty good. Um, and 400 was as low as I go. Anyone who does automotive spray painting will be looking at me going, what? You know, you should probably sand much finer than that, but 
This bloke doesn't have a huge amount of patience. <clears throat> anyway, I could not get the spray, the top coat to spray properly. Um, I had a lot of overspray problems, which I think means I had a bit much pressure on the, um, the compressor, too much air pressure. Um, but anyway, you could see overspray stripes in the top coat. And that's like, oh, but you know, it's fixable. So I got some 800 grit wet and dry paper, uh, which is like the black paper that you get at the hardware shop that you could use with water. And I just gave it a sand, sand it with 800 wet and dry. And then I used a automotive cutting compound and a buffing tool and I buffed it. <clears throat> and this is where you could really see the pinholes because the buffing compound stays in the pinholes. So maybe some years down the track, there will be no pinholes full of buffing compound in my boat when they finally all get washed out. Well, maybe I'll learn how to do automotive spray painting better and sand it off and do it again. I don't know. Anyway, as you probably gathered, the boat's been sailing by now um, and it's great. It's really good. I can't believe how much fun this little boat is. Um, it's got room for two people in it. Um, Given it's so small, it's easily room for two people and some other and some other bits and pieces. Um, we have gone with what's called um, a lug rig. This would normally be called a balanced lug rig, where on one side the sail has the mast sticking out, but I've done it in such a way that you can dip the lug behind the mast, so the sail is always on the right side of the mast. So I'm calling that a combination lug. Anyway, that's enough of talking about rigs. I'd like to talk about the little game that's been banging around in my head while I've been working on this project. Basically, um, I design board games all the time. Every time a idea comes into my head, I'll mull it around a bit, I'll make a prototype and play around with it a bit and maybe just put it on the shelf. Um, and maybe I won't think about it again for another year or something. It's something I do for fun. So it's, it's not for any other reason than that. Um, in fact, uh, the ones that I've... Uh, are reasonably satisfied with, you can print and play yourself. You just need to gather a few bits. If you have a printer and a sharp knife and a, and a bit of like crafty skill, you can make yourself a game, have a play with your friends. There's, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link below to um, where you can download them from. I host them on my webpage. Um, and I only make the ones that work reasonably well print and play. There, I have many more ideas that are actually on the webpage, but there's nothing um, there that doesn't work. Anyway, so a little sailing game. One of the things I wanted to uh, try and model is how the wind changes because sailing is all about managing what the wind does, um, amongst other things. Um, and no game really does this very well. And initially I thought I'd have do this with um, what a mechanic I like to call uh, simultaneous card play, where everyone plays a card face down, you flip them up and then the order that the cards get activated depends on a number or a letter or something like that. Um, and this way, everyone can have a crack at what they would like to do. But they may or may not get to do it because of like cards other people have played that they're not aware of. In this game, there's a row of cards across the top of the board um, that uh, represent winds that are either easterly or westerly or combinations thereof, north, east, south, west, blah, blah, blah. Um, because when you're sailing around the world, um, your prevailing winds are important and they're usually easterly or westerly, broadly speaking. Anyway, um, when the numbers on the cards uh, were big enough in the colour that you wanted, you could move on to the next space on the board. Um, and there were bonuses and ways you could interfere with other people. I didn't like it. Didn't work the way I wanted when we tried to play it. Um, you know, this is always the way when you're making... Uh, get board games, you like have an idea in your head, you give it to other people and they break it, which is good because, you know, you need to know about these things. Anyway, um, on the third iteration of the board, because I've uh, made three boards now, um, the numbers are now between the dots rather than under them because like you put, a, you put your piece on the board and, you know, you can't see the number because like your piece is on it. That's annoying. Um, and initially this didn't matter because the number you were shooting for with your card play was on the next piece space along the track. Um, but as things develop and change, it went from being in front of you to underneath you, um, and that all changed. And then I had to change the coloring system because that didn't really work very well either. Um, and then I ended up using dice. Um, 
Board game designers tend to sneer at dice a little bit um, because, you know, the whole idea that you roll a dice and move a piece along a track, that's not a game, that's an exercise. You haven't made any choices there other than, you know, not rolling the dice. Um, so when you go to use dice in a board game design, you want to give the person whose turn it is some choice, some way of affecting their turn and possibly affecting other people's turn. So in this game, there'll be four dice. Uh, you pick the one that you want and use it, and then you move it down a track towards the center of a compass rose where the dice becomes slightly less effective. So if someone wants to use that dice after you, it's not going to be quite as good. So therefore, you could possibly take a, a, a suboptimal move for yourself to make someone else's move even more suboptimal. This is the sort of thing you want to create when you're designing a game. However, if none of the dice suit you, you can pick one up, anyone you like, roll it, um, and put it on the outside of the track where it will start its, its journey towards the center again. Um, however, if you do this, you risk busting, pushing your luck luck. So if you ended up accidentally rolling a six, the wind is too strong and you've broken something on your boat, you take a penalty card or something. Anyway, we've played this version a few times. Um, I think it's better. It's meant to be something quite simple. Nearly all the designs I do are beginner friendly. Um, all of my board game designs, I limit my rules to two pages. Uh, so there's not a lot of rule reading to do. Um, I try and limit the amount of printing out and crafting that you will need to do. Obviously, if there's a deck of cards involved, well, you'll need to like, do that. But I've done some videos about how to make cards and tokens and things um, on the Party Meeple channel. Why not drop by and have a look? Anyway. I'm going to continue working on this. I would like to do a, an around the world sailing game that people could print out and play. And you know, for those days when it's not very nice to go sailing. So this probably won't just get put on the back shelf now. Um, it, I'll do some more work on it. And hopefully by the time of the final video, I will link to a how to play video for the windy around the world race. So what will the next video have? Well, we have a floating boat um, that we've talked about constructing, making strong, putting structure inside, and then filling, fairing, and painting. So that leaves us with a rudder, a centerboard, a mast, a yard, and some oars. And we'll talk about all of that and how I did it, although I haven't made the oars yet, but everything else is, is done. Um, we'll talk about how I did all of that in the next video. And if you're enjoying the journey, please give me a like and subscribe. We'll see you then.